I, I think I think there's something in that. Um, although all of my brothers were doctors, so, so they medical doctors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They may have stress. Uh, yeah, that may be. That has a lot to do. I had a lot of stress when I was the chief financial officer here. I can. Tell I you. bet. I bet. Oh, trying to keep the budget in balance. Okay. I brought you something. Recorded uh, uh, something I said already? Uh, by accident, not the financial officer. Oh. But, and I can erase that if you want to. No. All right. Uh, it's no secret. <laughs> uh, this is an interview by Francis Lomas Feldman with Dr. Carl Franklin on October 31st, Halloween Day, 2001. What I would like to know, Carl, is something about, oh, that's heavy, is something about how you came to the university and tell me how you began to get involved in university affairs besides teaching. <laughs> well, that's a long story, but Well, I, that's all right. We have time for the whole story. <laughs> I'll make it short. Well, uh, at the time, I was uh, vice president and professor of law at the University of Oklahoma, and we dearly loved the people there, uh, but the weather was not the best. Plus the fact that uh, our daughter uh, was born with a one eye turned in, and we went to the ophthalmologist in Oklahoma City and he said the best person in the whole United States is a doctor in Los Angeles. And we decided right then, among other reasons, that we wanted to get to this doctor in Los Angeles. And so that was part of the reason. The other part of the reason was... Who was the, who was the doctor? Do you remember his name? Yes. I, I, I'll come to it in just a moment. Uh, the other main reason was that uh, Carolyn and I had both served in the Navy in California, and Carolyn particularly, who came originally from the middle of Ohio, uh, fell in love with California and wanted to come back this way. So uh, after I graduated from the University of Virginia Law School, I was offered two positions. One was a clerk clerkship on the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, and the other was a job as vice president of the University of Oklahoma. And since we wanted to head west, we took the job in Oklahoma, though I had always wondered <laughs> whether I might have somehow managed a year to serve as clerk. Uh, for Justice Harold Burton of the United States Supreme Court. But in any event, never look back, I think, once you've made a decision. To so. so we were there at the University of Oklahoma, and I, then we had the opportunity to come as, I was vice president there and a part-time law professor, but our opportunity to come to California was at the University of Southern California as a full-time law professor. Interestingly enough, a <clears throat> professor of contracts had left to go to Stanford, and that left an opening. Secondly, they wanted to introduce a course in international law, and that was my main interest and my degree from Yale University law school in international law. And thirdly, they had introduced a course in legal accounting to, and it was a, a required course, to get students ready for partnerships and corporations and tax courses and so on. Uh, they had never had such a course, and it only lasted a few years, and then the law faculty changed that. But in any event... Who was the dean when you came? Uh, Dean Kingsley. Oh, Dr. Kingsley. Yeah. And he was my good friend. Well, uh, 
So, none of the law faculty had any particular background in accounting, and I had taught accounting at Ohio State University and so on. So, and up at the University of Alaska. <laughs> so, they hired me. The law faculty then was only a total of 12, 10 plus two deans, Dean Robert Kingsley and Associate Dean Oren Evans. And I suppose another reason we wanted to leave Oklahoma was because the weather is not always the best there. And Will Rogers, the eminent uh, humorist, often said, if you don't like the weather in Oklahoma, wait a while. The wind will start blowing the other way. <laughs> and it often did. And indeed, when I left Oklahoma in February of 1953 to come out here for an interview, I was invited out. It was snowing in Oklahoma. And when I arrived in Los Angeles at the airport, it was 72 degrees. And Warren Evans met me and drove me around. <laughs> and we had lunch out at Santa Monica on the beach at a restaurant. And I went back to the hotel, to the university club. It was then downtown. And I called up Carol. I said, boy, if USC Law School will have us, we're coming. Well, they decided to make an offer, and so that's how we came. Well, I and, then, and I was full-time as a law professor. Uh -huh. And as I wrote in my book about Carolyn, I had two reactions to that at the University of Oklahoma. One was from the head of the faculty there, uh, English scholar. And he said, well, I see you're going to become completely respectable. You're going to become a full-time professor. And the vice chairman of the board of trustees, who was a businessman, said, you mean you're giving up a vice presidency to become a professor? <laughs> he couldn't believe it. It depends on your perspective. Yes. So that's how we came. And then I was full-time professor, as you know, for until uh, 1960, well, actually 1959, and Norman Topping became president in 1958, and he had interviewed some different people here and brought some in from the outside. And so uh, he offered me the job as vice president and part-time law professor. I, I said, I don't want to give up my law teaching because you may get tired of me <laughs> or I may get tired of being a vice president, so I want to have uh, something to go back to. So I kept on teaching, at least I was holding class, to be honest, a uh, seminar in international law for four years. Finally, that got to be just too much uh, because often I taught the class from 8 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock on a Wednesday. And every two months, the Finance Committee of the Board of Trustees, of which I was the main staff member, had a meeting at 10 o'clock on that particular Wednesday. And I found that my mind was divided between teaching the seminar in international law on that, those particular Wednesdays. And I thought, well, it's not fair to the students. And anyway, I was getting so immersed in the financial affairs of USC that I then gave up teaching. I kept my professorship, but I didn't do any more mm -hmm. teaching except a few lectures now and then. So I became a full professor. Well, Norman Topping offered me the job in the fall of 1959 and to start in the fall of And I said, well, I can't do, I can't, I, I'd love to have the job, but I can't take it. Why not? Well, because I've been offered the honorary chair of international law at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. And again, this is on the book. Norman said, well, call up the admiral and tell him that I can see him doing that. You're not coming. I said, you know, I was only a commander in the Navy. If you're down the line, you don't call up an admiral and tell him anything. And anyway, I don't want to do that. He said, well, see if you can shorten it from one year to one semester. So I did 
right. I didn't call him. I wrote to the admiral and said, I've been offered this position, and could I come for one semester, sir? You know, you probably salute in a letter. And he said, well, that'd be all right on one condition. And that is that you write a, a book on international law during that one semester. Well, this was a How did you get interested in international law? Oh, because I had a wonderful uh, law professor, uh, Hardy Dillard, who later uh, became uh, a member of the World Court at The Hague. And then I was fascinated by international law. And I had done some work in international relations. And then I uh, was introduced to a man by the name of Myris McDougall of Yale Law School, who was a giant in the field of international law. And I had met him because I was a member of the International Law Committee of the uh, Bar Association of Colleges and Universities. And I met McDougall, was impressed with him, and I applied for a scholarship at Yale, DuPont Scholarship, and uh, no, a Sterling Fellowship there. It was a DuPont Scholarship at the University of Virginia. And so I went then for a year of study and then later had to do the dissertation and so on. That's how it But it's just like, how do people get interested in anything? They're often inspired by a teacher. And sometimes the teacher causes people to change their direction. I remember one time sitting around a group of about eight or nine uh, professors at, um, in the faculty club at Ohio State University, where I worked as assistant of the president before, before the war, and then I took a leave absence and went into the war, and then after the war I worked there before going to the University of Virginia Law School. And we went around the room and the question was asked, how many of you professors are teaching now what you started out in college to be your major? And only one of the eight or nine professors was still doing it. <laughs> Others had become inspired by a professor they had and changed their major to something else, which often happens. Well, why did you go into law in the first place? How did I go where? Why did you go into law in the first place? Oh, I'd always wanted uh, to study law. <laughs> I never felt I had the money to take three years off to do it. And actually, the University of Virginia, as this school and many law schools, uh, were on a speed-up program. So you could get your law degree in two calendar years, trimester basis, see? Well, it was strenuous because we finished one trimester on Friday and we started the next one on Monday. There was no chance. No time for recreation. No, that's right. And poor Carolyn, she struggled through that with me. We had our first two babies at the University of Virginia. We were kind of poor. <laughs> I tutored. Uh, I graded papers from one of the professors after my first year. So, so. But uh, I'd always been interested in law because my original background was in economics and accounting, and I studied some business law in connection with those courses, so I was interested in law. No, no family background in law. So, well, where does that bring us up? Well, well then you, uh, Dr. Topping persuaded you to take this other assignment. Yes. Well, uh, he had interviewed a fellow from Tulane University. And uh, the fellow finally said that he, this man was interviewed by the deans here to become the financial vice president. And uh, so I, he had an interview then with Topping. <laughs> uh, he was a friend of mine from my Oklahoma days, Tulane. And, uh, he said, well, why put that was in the book? And this is a self-serving statement. I'm sorry about it. But oh, no, let's have all the self-serving statements you feel like making. Right. He said, why, why, why are you interviewing me? You, you have one of the best financial men in the country, right? 
here on your law faculty. Shopping center, who is that? Says to Carl Franklin. So Doc interviewed me and looked at my background and decided, I guess he was desperate. <laughs> no, I think he was a man of great good judgment. Uh, I hope so. And I often say of Norman Topping, he was a great administrator, and I have lash marks on my back to prove it. <laughs> Actually, he was a good administrator. He delegated, which is absolutely essential for a president, because he can't do everything. But he was smart enough not to delegate and then forget it or walk away from it. He delegated, but he wanted periodic reports on what was happening in the various areas around the university. And of course, he was very frugal. Uh, boy, so many times when I prepared the budget for Norman Topping along with my staff, he would send it back and say, I want a 5% contingency field. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So we were, we were operating on a pretty tight so the income for the university was pretty low then, wasn't it? Oh, my goodness. When Norman Topping took over in 1958 as president of the university, the total endowment was only $8 million for a major university. That's pathetic, especially on this side. Well, currently, it's well over billion and a half dollars, the total endowment. It's been built up over the years. Part of that's inflation, but it's been built up. And when I became chief financial officer on February 1, 1960, the operating budget for the whole university, including the medical school, was only 21 and a half million dollars. Now the operating budget for this university is well over a billion dollars. And when Topic took over, there was no, there were no buildings under construction or even on the drawing board. And as you may remember, Norman got the faculty together, the faculty senate, I had been involved in the faculty senate, and said, what does the faculty need most? And we said, we need a place to have lunch. We only met once a month up in the top floor of the commons, and some faculty member would give a speech, some old-timers, now old-timers, and he said, well, okay, I'll make you a deal. I'll raise the money for a faculty club, $200,000, if the faculty will do two things. One, you get enough people to sign up so it will be financially viable, and secondly, if you will <laughs> collect the money to buy the tablecloths and the silverware and the coffee pots and the fruit. We said, we'll do it. Well, we had a backup. At that time, the dues were $6 a year for full-time faculty, five for associate professors, and four and down the line instructors, not too many instructors, and we decided that in order to make it financially viable, because we didn't know how many we were going to get to sign up, we had to make it six dollars a month for full professors, not a year, and five for associate professors and so on. And the faculty was, and staff too, were so hungry for a place that they could meet more than once a month, that we had 650 people sign up. Well, that financially underwrote the thing and so on. And, and Norman got five key uh, companies to give $100,000 each, 500000 to build that factory center. And the last time it was remodeled, just a few years back, it cost $2 million for all the remodeling that they did and only added 50%. And of course, we, that was the first building then that Norman Topping got for this campus. And 
it was a love affair between the faculty and staff and Norman Toppin for his having given us a place to have lunch and dinners and so on. Now, the downside of that was that we thought this was before any hotels in the area, and we thought when people were invited to the campus, it would be nice to have a place to meet instead of having them downtown at the university club where I went for, to stay overnight or one of the hotels. And you remember at that time, the, the tallest hotel in Los Angeles was seven-story Hilton Hotel. The tallest building was the city council building downtown. Well, that all changed subsequently when they figured out a way to build buildings that would stand up on an earthquake and so on. So that's how I came to USC. <laughs> Carolyn was delighted. Um, she would sometimes do the diapers for the children in Oklahoma, and <laughs> wind would blow dust on them. <laughs> She'd have to go all over again. Well, our first two children were born at the University of Virginia. Craig, who's now a, a computer specialist, vice president of the company. Sterling, you know Sterling. Yes, I know Sterling. And Sterling has uh, a degree from Stanford and two from USC and one from Loyola Law School. And then our next two children were born in uh, Oklahoma. Our third son, we thought we'd never get a daughter. Our third son was born, uh, and he's now a uh, venture capitalist in Hong Kong has been there for nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. Finally, we got a daughter, I tell you. you know, in, in those days, you couldn't tell until the baby was born whether it was a boy or a girl. Now, of course, the doctors have these uh, ways of telling ahead of time and so on. But some people don't want to know. A young professor here in the law school recently did his wife going to have a baby, and he said, I don't want to know until I see you see the baby. Okay. So he said to the doctor, don't tell us. <laughs> well, at any rate. Uh, tell Carol, me about your daughter, then what is she doing? Oh, oh, she's been with the GE Capital uh, Corporation up in Merced. She was in uh, public service for a long time in uh, hospitals and uh, elder uh, centers uh, in Long Beach and Ventura, taking care of older people. And then she decided that she, she has three degrees from USC, a master's degree and then a master's in, um, in business administration and a master's in uh, uh, public administration. So they're all, they, they have, uh, I say this to some of my friends who inquire, why did your three sons all go to Stanford, but your daughter came in and I said, well, I have a good answer. Our three sons went to Stanford because they wanted to get, get away from Dad. Our dad was looking over their shoulder, checking up on them. But when your daughter came to USC, yes, two reasons. One, Priscilla was interested in sororities, and Stanford would pretty much abolish their sorority. And secondly, as I used to kid her, she loved, wanted to be near Daddy's pocketbook. Carol, but Priscilla never liked that expression that I used. But, uh, she had a wonderful time here, joined the same sorority that Carol was in back in Denison, where Carol went. And that's uh, Death to Gamma sorority. So, and I, and I say to people, oh, would you have divided loyalties? No, 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 no. I have dual loyalties. Carol and I have dual loyalties because our four children have five degrees from USC and five from Stanford. That's pretty even. Yeah. Yes. About as even as you well, as I started to say, Carolyn was only the first girl in her family in 80 years. And so our chances of getting a girl. Oh, then you were lucky to get a girl. Oh, and, and no no boys, no girls in my family. I had two brothers and very few girls. So when Carolyn arrived, I tell you, she used to complain about being hugged so much by her <laughs> uncles and her dad. But she was a surprise the girl. So we were very happy when we got Priscilla. And this happened all while you were um, the vice president for financial affairs. 
Well, our children were born two in Virginia and two in Oklahoma. And, uh, so that you, you came here with four children. Oh, we came with four children. And I'd like to say to people, well, we weren't just ordinary Okies coming from Oklahoma to, to California. And we, we didn't have just one mattress on our pickup. We had two mattresses. You know, John Steinbeck spoke yes, yes, about the yes. trials and tribulations of Okies during yes. the Dust Bowl and so on. And so, but our children were all born within six years. So Priscilla was one year old, and Craig, the eldest, was seven. In fact, we arrived here on July 1st, his birthday, his seventh birthday. And then I had the summer to do some research work and so on, and I started teaching in the fall, mm -hmm. uh, full time. And then along the way, got involved with faculty senate and so on. Yeah, yeah, you were at the meeting of the um, faculty retired well, ex faculty president. Yeah. So when were you president of the Senate? I think in 1958. Yeah. Before that time, I was pretty busy. I taught up at the University, at the law school, University of, uh, at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, called Boat Hall. And then one summer, I taught out at UCLA Law School. And in between times, I was uh, on Bob Doxon's staff. He had a program going to bring in executives for him executive training program on campus and there were four professors and one of the professors most loved by the businessmen was Bill Long who was a retired professor of philosophy and Bill bless his heart he and I became very good friends and later on I handled his estate for him and so on <laughs> and one time I went to visit him and he was then 95 years old he lived uh, um, West Side, and his driveway uh, had uh, bricks, and it was kind of rough. He never used a cane, and his wife was a lovely lady. Bill was a PhD from Harvard in philosophy, and was on our philosophy faculty for many years. And he stumbled just a little bit, and he said to me, "You know, I begin to walk like an old man." <laughs> he was 95. <laughs> Oh, bless his heart, he was within one month of becoming a hundred before he passed away. He had moved when he was about 98 or 99. His daughter moved him up to Northern California so he could be closer to where she lives. So, one month away from being a hundred. She had let him be where he was, he would have made it. <laughs> he might have. Mm -hmm. He was a delightful person, just a wonderful human being. One of my good friends who I was old time. So, that's about yeah. well, So then you were uh, vice president for financial affairs, and yes. what happened? Well, I was vice president for uh, 13 years, and I was also, without uh, having the title, I looked after the legal affairs. But in those days, there were two law firms who handled all the legal work. One was Music, Peter, and Garrett. And L. Vaughn Music was the head of that firm, and he was on our board of trustees. And he gave some $4 million to this law school for the building. His name is on the plaque out there, the entrance of the law building. And they handled everything except probate work. And the probate work was handled by Maurice Jones, a 1925 graduate of this law school, an old timer, who was very much into civic affairs. He was mayor of San Marino and all sorts of things. At any event, all, mostly what I did, I handled some work as legal officer. Mostly I was in charge of finances, and I had a wonderful staff of people. But I would do some legal work in-house, but mostly I farmed it out to Music Peter and Garrett, and they had then a senior party by the, partner by the name of Jerry Kelly, who was a graduate of our law school. And that's the harsh. I knew him when he was county council. Did you really? As before he moved? Yes. Well, and Jerry Kelly, at that time, Francis, we didn't have very much legal work. In fact, Jerry Kelly's firm, Music Peter and Garrett, 
only sent a bill every three months. And then eventually, you know, there's so much legal work, they had to bill every month. One thing G Jerry did, I've seen him bill so many times, all the legal work, and, and he would put down <laughs> less 25%. <laughs> That's all USC had to pay. Uh -huh. And Maurice Jones did the same thing. They were both... That was generous. Both. Yeah, generous, but they were professional attorneys. They weren't so concerned as, I'm sorry to say, law offices are about the bottom line and getting so many billable hours in that you can bill for. It. And Maurice Jones also uh, reduced, reduced the bill. <laughs> Because it's USC, it's our university. We're helping to support, and they need the support. So, well, that was a great break for USC. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. And then, um, I, I suppose, this may be of interest. It's in the, again, in the book, uh, I, I began to get acquainted with some key trustees. <clears throat> I was the chief financial officer. And, like Frank King was uh, head of the United California Bank, it was then, and he was chairman of the Finance Committee, and Asa Call was, you know, chairman of the Board of Trustees, and Celie Mudd uh, was on the Board of Trustees and on the Finance Committee, and John Stauffer was on the Finance Committee. Well, through my association, uh, then I, they, they were very helpful, let's put it that way. Uh, Seely Mudd named me as one of three trustees of the Seely Mudd Fund when it was established at his death. And along with Bob Fisher, who was a chief financial officer here, and Luther uh, Anderson, who was a longtime associate of Seely Mudd. And as you know, the, you've seen the bulletin on the Seely Mudd yeah. building. Uh, all the gifts that we made all over the country. And we started out with uh, uh, 25 or 30 million, and we gave away over 50 million, creating buildings costing over 150 million. Because we usually required, this is after CD had died, I'm talking about now, yeah. when the three of us were the three key trustees, and we were trying to carry out CD's wishes because we all knew him personally. In fact, I visited him in his home, oh, less than three weeks before he died. And we had a wonderful visit. He was lying up in his bed in his bedroom. Uh, and that's the property that he gave to USC, which is now the headquarters of the home of the president of the university. So then I got acquainted with John Stauffer, and he named me as a trustee upon his death to help carry out his wishes uh, for the Stauffer Charitable Foundation, and the other two were attorneys, and uh, one was Joe Burris, who was former president of the Alumni Association of Stanford, and the other was uh, an attorney here with uh, Latham Watkins. And so we, well, and we started out, we started out that fund 26 years ago. That's the Stauffer Trust with 7.2 million. And today it has about 70 million. And we've given away 40 million. And USC has been the principal beneficiary. All the universities, all the hospitals, Nothing knew what he was doing when he selected you. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I hope so. <laughs> no, you, no, you take a big chance. I, I think back the time that the, I was brand new, uh, just out of law school, as I told you earlier, and I was invited out for an interview at the University of Oklahoma. Let's see, I was 37 years old. This was after the war period and after two strenuous years, three years of law study at the University of Virginia. And George Cross, then the wonderful president of the University of Oklahoma, who had carried, helped carry that university through 
trials and tribulations, the war period and before and so on. And he offered me a job, and I, th I thought many times since, you know, he was taking a big chance <laughs> because he made me the vice president. And there were only two vice presidents. Besides, uh, George was the president and uh, made me the, not the vice, uh, financial vice president, but the academic vice president of the university and a part-time law professor. But uh, there again, Francis, I have to tell you, uh, I've had been so lucky in all of my life. <laughs> Things opened up at the time when I was ready to move in. And at the University of Oklahoma, they had a wonderful man who was the academic vice president. And his name was Dangerfield. And I'll tell you a story about that just in a minute, a short story. And he moved to the University of Illinois, but that opened up the position. And so several people were invited for an interview, and I was one of them. <laughs> and then on the way, the president himself, I had met with the faculty and the deans. They had two positions open. One was dean of business administration, and the other was this vice president. And I let it be known early on that I, I wasn't interested in being a dean of the School of Business Administration. I guess I was pretty bold. So just in other words, <laughs> I'll be vice president if you want me to. <laughs> But I, but I already had a back, backlog because I had this offer of Justice Burton to go to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so I would... So you could be free to say what you wanted. Well, I just I have to be as cautious as a 37-year-old should have been. But then, after all these interviews, the President himself drove me from Norman, Oklahoma to Oklahoma City, which is about 20 miles, to the airport. And... <laughs> A very interesting thing happened. As we were driving along, I said to Norman, to uh, George Cross, who's a marvelous man, I said, well, it's really expensive for you to bring people out here for interviews. Is that you? No, she, she gets it done. Uh, particularly, if the person you invite out is not the person you want. Are we at the end of the tape? No, no, I'm, I'm just making sure that it's okay. Right. <laughs> he says, <coughs> well, yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> so it was a very kind of definite answer. And when I got back, I thought about that all the way. Back to the University of Virginia. And flew into Washington, got down and got home, and I said to Kelly, well, I guess we're not <laughs> going to get the job at Oklahoma, much as I would have loved it because I liked the people, and they were really outstanding in general. <laughs> and Carol said, well, you've always got the clerkship uh, in Washington, D.C. before us, Justice of the Supreme Court. So, but the next day, an offer came from the University of Oklahoma. And when I came home from class at the University of Virginia, Carolyn said, guess what it says? Uh -huh. And she, she was excited, as excited as I was, because we were heading west. That was the point. She wanted so much to get back to California, which we did. So, but I, I really have been. Well, after you uh, became the uh, Vice President for Financial Affairs, what was your role in the university? What was my role as Vice President for Financial Affairs? Well, no, you went on from that. Oh, oh, after that. Well, as I told you, while I was Vice President for Financial Affairs, I was doing uh, some in-house legal work, but farming it out to the two firms, but seeing that it got done and on and on. We didn't have as nearly as much as we had then, though I was involved personally in getting property so that the university could expand. And I, I'm, I like to say this, and that is that we had six cases of eminent domain. First of all, we had appraisal made of every house in this whole area. 
we wanted to buy to expand, you know, to Vermont. And we offered everybody 10%. Uh, we, we showed them the appraisal, and we offered them 10% above the appraisal, all cash. And uh, everybody took it except, did I say six, five people. And one of the five, and we won, and I'm sorry, six of those people, and one of the ones wouldn't accept and took us to court. And the others settled because they realized that if they went to court, they might get less, which would be true, uh, because we had offered above 10% above the appraisal price. And the one lady who wouldn't settle and so on, of course, Court and she perjured herself on her court on the stand. There's not much we could do with that. So I was involved in that. Well, then along came uh, Dr. Caprillion, or Hubbard, in 1970, and I was still vice president of finance for three years. But I was, I think it's fair to say, too conservative for uh, Dr. Hubbard and particularly Dr. Caprillion, who wanted to expand the operations and so on. And he did a great job, no question. He came from Caltech, you know, yeah. and so on. But uh, so then Hubbard uh, brought in a new, appointed uh, Colin McLeod as, a, I guess, was vice president, but chief financial officer anyway. And I then was vice president for legal affairs, and that was my sole job. So I, all along, I was getting involved in fundraising with C.D. Mudd and John Stauffer and lots of Carolyn's friends and so on. And uh, so then I was a legal vice president for 10 years until Zumberg, until 1983. That was two years after Zumberg arrived, two or three. And then he wanted his own legal counsel and buy and, and have bigger legal staff not farm out so much. By then, the volume of legal work had increased. Meanwhile, I had added to my staff as chief legal counsel and was doing more work in the house in order to save money. So, and then when the new, then I was made just vice president at large, whatever, whatever that means, but devoted most of my time to fundraising. And then when Sample came in on the recommendation of Zumberg. I was made vice president emeritus. So. Well, you really have watched the way the university has developed oh. and had a big role in that. Well, some. You say that modestly. Well, Carol and I know this university. She was not a graduate. She was really well, I know I know how active she was in the town and gown. Yes, yes. And she was wonderful in courting a lot of these elderly people. And one of the reasons was that her own father died when she was 13. And so uh, she came of a family of Craigs in Washington Courthouse, Ohio, where she grew up. And they had the Craig department store, and they weathered the depression barely. And the stress on her father, who was the chief financial officer of Craig Brothers uh, department store, I think caused his early death. So she grew up uh, with Father Craig. Her grandfather was always referred to as Father Craig. He was the great patriarch of the Craig family, and everybody deferred to him. And he was a wonderful, wonderful built the Methodist Church where Carol, Carol and I were married in Washington Courthouse, Ohio, and so on. And he was the one who <laughs> walked her down the aisle to give her away. I've never liked that expression about walking your daughter oh, yeah. down to give her away. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so it was Father Craig, and we were married in the church. We were, Carol and I were both in the Navy then. And of course, when I met her and I swore her into the Navy, you know that story, I think. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think you should tell it to the tape. <laughs> well, uh, I was working at Ohio State, and after Pearl Harbor, I wanted to sign up, get in the Navy, and get on board ship. And so, so I went 
down and sign up for the Navy. And I filled out the form and so on. And one of the questions was, have you ever had hay fever? And I said, yes. And the officer looked it over. He said, sorry, we can't take you. I said, well, why not? Well, you had hay fever. I said, well, that's when I was a boy. I haven't had any trouble with it since. And he said, sorry, that's the rule. You check that box, not admissible. <laughs> I was uh, disappointed. And I, I thought to myself, look, I'm not joining the Army where they have horses and hay. <laughs> I want to join the Navy. <laughs> so I went. I don't know if I should put this on tape. I'll put it on. I'll put it on. Time is, time is gone. So I went to another naval officer for, to be recruited, and I had a temporary lap, lapse of memory, and I forgot to check that box that I ever had hay fever. And everything looks fine. But I see I had a degree from Harvard by this time, and so on. And, oh, we can use you in the Supply Corps. A lot of your Harvard classmates are going into the Supply Corps. Some of them did get in early, and they went overseas, and they never came back. But in any event, uh, so they said, we can offer you a commission as Lieutenant J.G. I said, fine. What ship am I going to be on? I said, not for a fire. You have to go up to report to Detroit for some indoctrination. You know, you have to learn how to salute, which side of a senior officer to walk on, and all these very important things for winning a war. And anyway, then I went up to Detroit, and Detroit said, we need to open an office of Naval Officer Procurement in Columbus, Ohio. And since you've been there and you know people and you visit the universities, now there are two, two divisions. One is an Office of Naval Officer Procurement for officers, and the other is enlisted men. And they had an office for enlisted people coming into the Navy, those without college education and so on. So they sent me back. So, uh, I'll, I'll skip now to the end of the war when I had the pleasure of meeting Mildred McAfee, but then she had married Reverend Horton, a Navy chaplain, and I didn't know her very well, or I would have joked her about taking out some insurance for the future, but I didn't know that well. <laughs> but she came to the University of Oklahoma, where I was by then vice president. And I had the pleasure of introducing her. And I said, uh, Miss, Mrs. McAfee, Admiral, Admiral McAfee, you don't remember me, but I used to work for you. And she gave me such a puzzled look, as though she had never seen me, which was true, she had. And I said, yes, uh, I was in Naval Officer Procurement, and you were head of the waves. And uh, this beautiful young lady wanted to sign up for the waves. Her name is Carolyn Craig. She was seated beside me at this head table. So. And I had already got 99 for you, and I thought, this one is for me. <laughs> and when she got up to respond, oh, she was such a clever lady, she said, well, by Dr. Franklin's own admission, his wife is one in a hundred. <laughs> well, I love Miller McAfee, you know, I'd never met her before. But she had such a delightful sense of humor. And she explained that at the dinner, she said, you know, W-A-P-E-S is the acronym. And a lot of people don't know what that stands for, what that stood for during the war. Women, women's voluntary emergency Women's Auxiliary Voluntary Emergency Service. She said, that's not what it stood for. It stood for women are very essential sometimes. <laughs> of course, you know, it was just a truth. That's a much nicer way of putting it. Yes. And more accurate. Well, it happened, I didn't know it at the time, when Carolyn came in. I was pretty good. I tell you, I don't I don't have a, my picture's right home in our Navy uniform. Well, you can see this. Oh, yes, I, I see this. At any rate, she came in, and I learned later this little incident that 
her brother, I had sworn in her younger brother into the medical corps, Navy Medical Corps, three weeks before. And Dr. Joe, Craig, he's a medical doctor, who studied at Ohio State and then went on to get a master's degree at the Mayo Clinic, where Carolyn's famous uncle was head of neurosurgery, so it kind of all ties together. And Wink Winchell Craig, they everybody called him Wink, became the first Navy Admiral in the Medical Corps, in the Navy. He is very high ranked, so wonderful man. And anyway, Dr. Craig, Joe Craig, said to Carolyn, Oh, I met a wonderful lieutenant up there. He swore me and gave me the oath of office. I hope you get him when you get there. Well, there were only two lieutenants in the office at that time, a fellow by the name of Roger Finkbein, who came from did you say fish pond? Fink, F-I-N-K, Fink by him. And he was a wonderful man. He had all sorts of waivers. He was an older man. And he outranked me, but he let me run the office because he came in after I got the office started in Columbus, Ohio, the old post office building. And so normally I was out visiting colleges and universities and talking to people about to graduate, including young ladies, to get them signed up to join the waves. But this day, he was out in the office, and I was there when Gerald came, and the rest is history. So, I, I used to say to my Navy friends who met Carol, and said, you know, before I agreed to give her the oath of office, I made her promise to marry me. And their response was, brother, she must have loved her country to have agreed to that. <laughs> well, it didn't happen quite that soon, but uh, How long were you married? 49 years. 49 wonderful years. And she passed away eight years ago. Now, were you involved also in town and gown? Pardon? Was I? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I started, I think a little while ago, I mentioned about uh, Carolyn uh, was uh, really such a sweetheart to many elderly people, particularly people who didn't have any children. Uh, or, I think of a Spencer lady down in Escondido that we courted for 20 years, and they left, she left her whole estate to the sea and down and down. Uh, Edith Purer, her name was. She had a PhD from SC way back and became a high school teacher and so on. And uh, uh, then others like uh, Monty, G. Donald Montgomery, they had one child, a son, who was killed in an automobile accident going up to uh, Berkeley for a football game. No other children. Carolyn became the surrogate daughter for Marty, and he was always wanting to do something for her. Well, this kind of thing. Of course, I explained earlier that Carolyn grew up with all these uncles and with Father Craig as the great patriarch, and so she had, I, I think she developed a special expertise <laughs> in dealing with older people. At least she was very successful in raising a lot of money for town and gown scholarships and other good causes. Well, I think she certainly did uh, an unusual job for town and gown. Well, I like to tell this story, and I say it's important. When she started in 1970, she was co head of of the scholarship committee, along with Matty Kinsey. Now, George Kinsey owned a lot of property, and Kinsey's and Franklin's became good friends. And George had a ranch, and I went up there and took Hubbard up there shooting. Hubbard loved to go out to shoot uh, quail and birds and so on. Well, those two, when they started, there were four part-time scholarships in town and gown. This year, they awarded hoarded over 200. Amazing. And in 1970, when they started, the total endowment 
of town and gown for scholarship was a little bit under 175,000. When Carolyn passed away eight years ago, it was over 16 million. Now it's grown something. By the way, some of the growth occurred because Carolyn's prospects died and then left their estate even after Carolyn passed away. So it's now 24 million. <laughs> 30 years. Well, that's an amazing achievement. Uh, well, everybody worked hard, not just Carol and me, none of others, but we interested people. Now, have you been active with other organizations on the campus? Have I? Mm -hmm. Well, mostly when I was vice president. I mean, before I was vice president, I was on the faculty. For example, I at the request of Dr. Robenheimer, who was then vice president, I pleaded the case before the NC2A on some infractions that we had, and did some other work, legal work, uh, that time. So. <laughs> Roby asked me to do that. I wasn't too keen about it, because I was busy with other things, and teaching in the summers, and, CLA at Berkeley, but Carolyn said, he's been so wonderful to us, you just have to do this. Well, I investigated and I discovered that, I won't mention names here, but two people on the, in the athletic department had caused these infractions and they were serious. And uh, so I went back to Chicago to meet with the NC2A infractions committee. The chairman of the committee was from the University of Kentucky. <laughs> and he remembered, in my introduction to him, he said, oh, I remember uh, when Kentucky was put on probation. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> we've lost this case before we started. Well, That and a few other things. I was yeah, but you say you thought you'd lost that case, but did you? Well, yes, we lost. We were fine. We were put on probation. This was early in Norman Topping's career here. And I was still on the law faculty. Well, faculty senate and so on. And uh, we got two years probation. I think it cost us $2 million, but I did the best I could. I, 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 I really worked hard on that brief to the committee, but I think the decision, we, we were guilty. Well, you know, when, when there's guilt, there's not much you can do about it. I <laughs> Now, I know you have, uh, you're a member of Phi Kappa Phi. Uh, are there other organizations? Pardon? Are there others besides Phi Kappa Phi that you are affiliated with? Oh, yes, that's in there. Is that in here? Yeah, that's in open. Yes, I can read that. Uh, Very good. Somewhere in there about experience. On um, an organization. Yeah. When you look back at your life at USC, what would you say is the highlight, or is there any one? <laughs> well, I suppose the highlight, yes, was when Carolyn and I were given the presidential medallion by Steve Sample. Hers was posthumous. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was there. I remember that. Oh, I tell you. The phone call came. Now, this happened in March, but the phone call came along a 
about November, October, November, was she sat on it. <laughs> and he said, What would you say was the On worst? the recommendation of a lot of people, including trustees, <laughs> I'm going to award you and tell him the president of my dad <laughs> next March. <laughs> I could say anything. I was so choked. <laughs> and the door was open. <laughs> and I just I started to sob. And Helen came in and said, Dr. Franklin, what's the matter? And I still couldn't talk, and I put a piece of the machine, and I typed out what the president said. And then I closed the door. I have a button, and it says automatically close the door. Mm -hmm. That was a very... emotional experience. Yeah, and it was a very well-deserved uh, commendation, I think. But I've been <laughs> offered honorary degrees. I declined them because you came from an institution that I was helping to support. So the city of the bar and those type of funds. No, looks like a conflict of interest. It won't work. So you bought your gift. Oh, uh, aren't you kind? Thank, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good, that was really nice Thank you, to keep Ellen. an FBI up. So I've steadfastly refused them. But, oh, there have been a lot of highlights. Oh, gosh. The day I married Joe. That, that, was, that was the highlight, I guess. Oh, that was the highlight. I was so nervous and the stories in the book. But it's a very interesting book to read. Carolyn. Uh, one of the things about it, that some of my friends have said, you know, you can pick it up and help it up almost anywhere. Any place. You start reading. Uh, there are about 280 vignettes in there. You can pick and choose. Well, I think, I think it's a great... Uh, well, uh, so here was wedding day, and Carolyn and her mother had gone up. Carolyn had flown in from San Francisco. Her mother had sent her money for a wedding dress and say, Carolyn, you spend it all on your wedding dress. Don't put some of it in your savings bank. Carolyn was always a great saver, very, very frugal <laughs> all of her life. And so I was then just getting ready to go up to the church. My parents had already left. I <laughs> never have been married before. I was you know, pretty nervous. And a man next door neighbor by the name of Chunk said, Now, Carl, don't do what I did. Don't say, With this wing I be red. T.T. Um, Chunk. I could hit him. <laughs> so, all the way to the church, I kept saying, With this ring I be red. <laughs> But you came through it all right. I did, but I was still He made you nervous. So nervous. And Dr. Joe, as Carolyn's younger brother, was my best man. And he had the ring. And when it came to that point, the minister said, the ring? I, <laughs> Joe handed it to me. I was really nervous. And I said it right. <laughs> kind of relaxed, but I heard some twittering in the background. Oh, they're laughing. And I said, I said it right with this ring I mean, I really spelled it out. <laughs> well, the minister was waiting for me to kiss the bride. He'd said the rest of his little speech, and I'll pronounce your man and wife. And I just stood there. <laughs> You know, thinking to myself, I said it right. 
That's a very true story. I can almost relive it right now. And finally, he nodded to me, and I nodded to him. More twittering in the back. I thought, what are these people twittering about? And finally, he said, you may kiss the road. And when I tell this story, and told it to our daughter, Priscilla, when she was young, she said, Daddy, how could you have forgotten to kiss mother at your own wedding? <laughs> I said, well, I was pretty nervous. And I went, well, that was certainly a sign of it. But T.T. Junk, he, he really upset me. I could hit him over the head. So that's that story. Well, uh, I will refer to your book uh, in the record, too, so that uh, we have reference. And I think we have one in our archive. Yeah, thank you. And um, I think that will be a great addition. Is there anything you think of that you would I'm sorry? like to say? No, I think I George Well, I don't know if you remember, but I was on your committee for the uh, faculty center. Yes, Do you remember that? Yes. I think that's when we met. Well, I, I, is it still on? No. No. Wait, you want to say something? I can turn it on easily. Well, okay, yeah, keep going. Turn it on. Early on, I forgot to say to you that when I swore Carol in here, the way, Navy, way, Navy had a rule then that uh, a married woman could not join. And if you got married, you had to get out. Well, I was all for getting married, but uh, <laughs> I didn't want her to get away, but she, she uh, was very loyal, and uh, so she stayed in. But then the Navy changed its rule so that married women could girls could get married and still stay in because they needed they needed this talent yes. and they weren't getting enough of it because a lot of girls said well I don't want to sign up I, I'd rather get married or I may want to get married while I'm in the Navy and I don't want to get kicked out and so on so that was why that rule was changed and that enabled Carol and me to get married while we were both our she was still in the Navy. Mm -hmm. but for that we we thought we were going to have to wait till the end of the war. Mm -hmm. But we were married in 1944, and the war didn't end until the fall of 1945. Well, good. I'm glad you married her while you were still in service. I didn't want her to get away. <laughs> well, that's good. that's on the table one as she wanted to. One time I thought I'll surprise her. So I hopped a Navy plane called MATS, Military Air Transport. And if you were in uniform you could get a free ride if they had a space for you. So I hopped a plane and I arrived in the evening, a Friday evening in San Francisco. Carolyn was living there with five other WAVE officers in the uh, Fielding Hotel where the uh, uh, people used to come who were in on the stage. Mary Pickford and others would stay in these quarters on top of the Fielding Hotel. So I said, I'm here. Uh, get dressed in the evening, you know, maybe 10 o'clock. And so, so she got on her Navy uniform and I was on mine. And I first checked the Fielding Hotel and said, sorry, we don't have any room. So I called up. Carol, anyway, and we walked around in different hotels and couldn't find a place, a, a, a bed, to speak. So we went back, and Carol went back up and joined her wave officers, and I stretched out on the couch in the mezzanine floor of the Fielding Hotel. <laughs> Again, that story is in the book, and, and the lady came down, uh, saw Carol, and said, is that your poor husband <laughs> stretched out there? <laughs> yes, he surprised me, but he surprised himself even more. Because, but then we were able to get together the next man. <laughs>
Well, Trials and tribulations of the war. Yes, yes, and this is a very different kind of war we're in, although people still are separated. Yes. Oh, yes, it is a different. Yeah. Well, I I do appreciate very much your yeah. giving me this.